Okay, um, so we're talking about Unit 16. Um, at the beginning of Unit 16, there's a discussion of um, two verbs, um, one, one that's systematically an athematic verb, like histeme, titheme, and didome, and one that's an athematic verb only in the second aorist. So let's take them one by one. The first is the this verb, feme, which has several peculiarities. As you can see from the accent on the form, feme, with an acute on the last syllable, it's, uh, it, that's not the norm for verbs which are have recessive accent. And what th that accent is doing there is telling you that this verb is enclitic in almost all of its forms. Um, actually, I think, so we, there are some that are, that are toned, and, but the majority of them are not. And that, for example, in the in the present, which is what we're going to start out by looking at, but um, only the second person singular form has a has an accent. Um, um, I think "famen," for example, should have an acute on the epsilon because it's not a not an untoned word in the same true fata. Okay, um, so. What does this word mean, and why is it a, a, a word without an accent? Why is it an enclitic? It, it's the word that means to say, okay, um, and and it's say in the sense of, for example, when you're telling a story, so and you're reporting somebody that somebody says something, um, and what you do is you say, uh, at this point she said, and then you have quote, and you say what the person said. <coughs> Um, in other words, <coughs> it's the most neutral, uh, and that's really, I think this is another example of the unmarked word for say, mm -hmm. that notion of an unmarked form, okay, it can mean, it, you can use it for things that are really important, okay, mm -hmm. um, but its its basic function, um, most of it is, is, uh, is to introduce speech in the most generalizable way, okay. So it's especially in the in the first person in the present forms you use it especially when when you say I say he says she say says and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it, it's used very often in real Greek and and it wouldn't be worth telling you about um, because it's an archaic word whose form is archaic, just like histeme, titheme, and didome. And these archaic forms hang on because they're in such common notions, okay? So this is the old inherited word for say. Um, the, the, uh, they show many of, this for, word shows many of the characteristics that we've seen for the athematic verbs like histeme, titheme, and didome. One thing that this word doesn't have is reduplication in its system, okay? Um, so there is an older an old word, pifasco, that does, okay, derived from this root. It's been thematized, so there were, there were forms with reduplication once, um, but, but this word never, um, never had it. So it doesn't have reduplication, but it has the endings of an athematic verb. So if we look at fe me, fe is fe se, those are like dido me, dido, dido se. Um, did men did te did asi okay the third person plural ending in asi um, and the way they're formed that is you have a root which can be you notice that it alternates between a long vowel form fe with an eta and a short vowel form fa in the singular you have the eta and the plural you have the alpha okay the short vowel we, this is exactly this kind of uh, vowel alternation. Um, formation that we've seen in the other athematic verbs. So it's a variation on a theme. It's, it's very much like didome, tithame, and histeme. Histeme is the one that has the alternation between eta and alpha, and short alpha, um, but it doesn't have reduplication and it has those endings. So we see it in the present, that is you have the alternation between eta and alpha in the stem, and we also see it in the imperfect ephain, ephaista, ephain, ephamen, ephasa, ephason. There's something very weird about the ending of the second person singular. That's not what you'd expect is face with a sigma, like face, um, which you sometimes actually do have, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's a very old second person singular ending. We're going to come across it in, a, in some other uh, words. It's not a middle ending. It's not a passive ending. It's an active second person singular 
ending. Okay, um, and so um, there, are the, there are the present and the imperfect of this verb in the active voice. All the other forms of it are based on the short vowel stem fa. Okay, the book says something about another stem with an epsilon, but it's, uh, I believe, mistaken. The, everything else, so the, the subjunctive is going to be full face, fe, full men, fe, te, fe, si, fo, si, rather, um, so forth. Uh, er, the optative is going to be fi, yain, fi, yais, fi, yais. You can look at these forms in the book. They're on page 461, okay? Um, I don't think there are any surprises in them. The same is true of the the uh, imperative forms, which are based on the f form of the stem. All right, um, let's move on to the other fun funky verb form. This is the verb gig gnosko. Okay, this is a reduplicative present with a ske sko suffix. The root is gno, which is the same as the English root kno. Okay, with a k. Um, the k, the original gamma, turns into a k in English, so it means no recognize. Um, all those kinds of things perceive, understand. So the forms of this verb are, are pretty much predictable, okay, if you learn its principal parts, except for one form, that is the aorist. And we've given you the aorist indicative form um, in the list in the, on, on the blackboard. You can see that what's going on with it is that you've got your augment, eh, you've got the stem, or the root gnol, and then you have the secondary endings of an athematic verb. Egnon, egnos, egno, okay, the same as etithane, etithes, etithe, and so forth, that you had for the athematic verbs, and then egno men, egno te, egno son, again, that third person plural ending that you, you just saw in the third person plural of the past tense of feme, of the imperfect of feme. So, um, um, this is a, another vestigial thing. In one part of this verb, you have an, an aorist form that's athematic in its, in its endings. Um, and you're going to see this randomly in other verbs, okay? This isn't the only example of this. And they're going to be in basic verbs. For example, the verb to go, which we haven't learned yet, has the same kind of an aorist, a vein, the way it looks. Um, the other forms of the aorist feature gna, a short vowel form, corresponding to what we were just looking at, fe and fa, gna and gna, with an omicron. So you have gnoyen, gnoyes, gnoye, the, the subjunctive um, gives you, because you've got omicrons in the stem, you've got omegas throughout, so it's gno, gnes, gnos, gno, gnomen, gnote, gnose, you deleted the etas out of the paradigm because you've got omicrons everywhere. But they're listed on page 463. The one, the one thing that is uh, not doesn't show the omicron is the all the forms of the imperative except for the third person plural imperative. So you have this archaic th ending for the um, for the second person singular imperative, the most common form. Gnothi. A lot of people know this word because it's a famous proverb. Gnothi sauton, which was over the written over the temple of Apollo at Delphi. Know yourself, okay? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it, the form with or without the se, mm -hmm. sauton. I think you have, okay? Mm -hmm. But um, so that's the imperative of the verb to know in the second person singular. But in the third person plural form, you have gnonton. You also have the gna form in the participle gnus, gnusa, uh, gnon, and gnontos. All right. Thank you.